Heavenly Father, as we've just sung, so we pray that you will speak to us today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Who would you say is in charge? Who would you say rules? You turn on the TV and it might look like Boris Johnson is in charge. He is certainly giving leadership to our nation and telling us all what we must do. But you might say that at the moment he's not really in charge. Coronavirus is in charge and not just of Britain but the whole world. It's wreaking havoc. Given a choice Boris Johnson would never have chosen to close all the schools. He would never have chosen for cinemas and theatres to be closed and cafes to be empty or to stop the Premier League or to cancel the European Cup and Eurovision. He'd never have chosen for EastEnders and the other, stop, the other soaps to stop filming or for the churches to close. I imagine the Olympics will be next. Huge global events all stopped by a virus. Sure, Boris Johnson is leading, but he's not exactly in charge. He and all the other powerful world leaders are being dictated to by a small, invisible little virus that seems, for the time being, to be controlling the world. And it's a bit frightening. It creates anxiety. It has already caused a great deal of suffering in all kinds of ways. That is what we see when we turn on our TVs. Everywhere we look, there are signs of the rule of coronavirus. And we're all up against it. We can't even meet together. When the Christians in the first century turned on their TVs, if they'd had them, they would have seen that the Roman Empire ruled. The Roman Empire was spreading around the world a bit like a virus. Everywhere people looked, they saw symbols of Roman might. The Roman eagle was fixed over all the public buildings. There was the all-conquering Roman army with its mighty military garrisons and grand Roman building projects reflecting the splendour and wealth of Rome. And there was terrible persecution and suffering for anyone who dared to step out of line. So Christians were up against it. There was suffering and persecution for those who loved and followed Jesus, especially if they didn't worship certain Roman emperors. Well, in his messages to the churches in chapters 2 and 3, Jesus has encouraged his people to hold on to him, to keep going, even when they are up against it and suffer terribly for their faith. And here in chapter 4, he shows John something to share with those suffering believers and with us too. Jesus himself invites John to see what is going on behind the scenes and to see the future destiny of all humanity. Have a look at verse 1 with me. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So John is being invited by Jesus to see the future, what must take place. In chapters 6 to 20, he will be shown what will happen on earth. But here, in chapters 4 and 5, he is given the most wonderful, glorious, reassuring vision of what is happening even now in the throne room of heaven. To John, it looks and feels like Rome is ruling. To us, it looks like America or China or Russia or coronavirus is ruling. That's the view from below, at street level. But this is an invitation to get a view from above, at God's level. It's like looking at St Andrews from street level. You can only see so much. But if we sent a drone up to take some pictures, we'd see far more. And if we go up even higher we can get a satellite view of Kendry. Well, that's what Revelation 4 is like. It's showing us the view from heaven of what is really happening. At street level, it looks at the moment as if coronavirus is ruling. And if we manage to defeat coronavirus, we might think that we rule again. But this perspective shows us what is really going on, and that those with power are not what they seem to be, and not as a and not as powerful as they might appear. 
So notice with me two things from this chapter, two wonderful things. Here's the first, it's coming up on the screen. See and know that God is on the throne. See and know that God is on the throne. Chapters four and five are focused on the throne of heaven. The throne is mentioned eight times in this chapter and a further 11 times in chapter five. And the thing to notice is that the coronavirus is not on the throne and neither are we human beings. Let's see who is on the throne. It's in verses two and three. At once, John writes, I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. So the throne of heaven is occupied. Someone is sitting on it. But the one who is on the throne is indescribable. He is likened to beautiful gemstones because he doesn't fall into any normal person categories. He is awesome. It's a description of God. No human features are ascribed to him, but these stones represent his character. There's Jasper, a clear and transparent stone representing his purity and holiness. There's Carnelian, a bright red stone, which might represent his wrath and his anger at sin. But then there's a rainbow resembling an emerald. The rainbow is a reminder of his promise and his faithfulness and his grace to undeserving sinful people. And around the throne are 24 other thrones with 24 elders. Elders are leaders and representatives of God's people. Johnny and I are the elders of our little church family. We lead the church family and we sometimes represent the church family at meetings or conferences. But these 24 elders represent all of God's people down the ages. They represent the complete people of God. The 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament and the 12 apostles in the New Testament. And they are dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. In chapter 3, that's the outfit that Jesus describes the Christians in the church at Sardis wearing. It's the clothing of all God's faithful people, dressed in white, reminding us that one day we shall be fully like Jesus, and crowns of gold confirming that one day God's people shall be victorious. And from the throne, verse 5, came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder, might remind us of the awesome and fearful power of God seen on Mount Sinai during the Exodus. And then there's a very strange thing. There is God on his throne at the very centre of things, surrounded by 24 elders on their thrones. But inside that circle of elders are four strange creatures. It's in verses 6 to 8. Verse 6, also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the centre around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. How weird is that? Weird but wonderful. But what does it mean? Well, those four creatures represent all creation all that is regarded as powerful in creation, all who rule in creation. There's the lion, the king of the wild animals. There's an ox, the most powerful of domesticated animals. There's the eagle, ruler of the skies. And there's man, who rules over all creation, the wisest and most intelligent of all creatures. Well, interestingly, 
these animals are often symbols of human power and rule. The Christians of John's day would have seen the Roman eagle plastered on everything. Their buildings, their coins, on the shields of Roman soldiers. And the eagle has been used many times since, hasn't it? The Nazis used it in the middle of the last century. The Americans use it still today. It is a sign of power and rule and greatness. What about the lion? Well, Britain uses it a lot. It is on the royal coat of arms. And three lions are on English football shirts. And a lion is also the branding for the English Premier League. It was also the symbol of UKIP. You know, lions have never lived in the wild in this country, and yet we have taken the image of a lion as a sign of power and rule and greatness. But here's the thing. These great animals and creatures are even greater here. They have wings and they are covered in eyes. The idea is that they see everything. And seeing everything, they have understanding and insight of what is true. And what do these great animals do? Well, they all worship the one who is on the throne. This vision would have shown John and all the Christians of his day that Rome did not rule. All the great empires and nations would bow down before God. It should show us that America and Britain and human ideologies do not rule. They will all bow to the one who is on the throne. Humanity is not on the throne. We are not the centre of creation or even of our own lives. I mean, if we were, do you think we'd let the coronavirus do what, it's, what, do what it is currently doing? Of course not. But we do not rule. We're not even close to ruling. Even a simple flu-like virus can humble the nations and destroy our plans and our economy and our idols. The idols of money and sport and travel and holidays. We do not rule. God rules. He is seated on the throne of heaven, ruling over all powers and authorities, no matter how big or powerful or domineering they may appear. Get this vision. This is what the churches in chapters 2 and 3 needed to see and know if they were to endure suffering and persecution because of their faith in Jesus. This is what John needed to see and know while he was imprisoned on the prison island of Patmos. And it is what we need to see too. What we are seeing here is entirely consistent with that vision in the Old Testament in Daniel where all the empires of the earth, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, are all superseded by God's eternal kingdom and God's eternal king. We might say the same of the British Empire and the United Kingdom and the European Union and the United States and the United Nations and the People's Republic of China and the Saudi Kingdom and anyone else who likes to flex their political muscles. However powerful they may appear, they will all come and go, just like all the other empires and kingdoms before them. But God will continue to be seated on his throne ruling over all. He has ultimate rule. He has overwhelming rule. And seeing this and knowing this will inspire and help us to persevere with our faith in Jesus, even when it feels hard, because ultimately God will have the last word. Coronavirus won't have the last word. Political leaders won't have the last word. Human ideologies won't have the last word. God will have the last word. See and know that God is on the throne. The second and final thing for us to uh, see and be encouraged by this morning is this. See and know that God is worthy of all worship. See and know that God is worthy of all worship. The main activity in the heavenly throne room is worship. Those winged creatures around the throne are worshipping. 
Verse 8 says, Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's worship. And they never stop. They never stop because God is eternal. Twice in verses 9 and 10 we are told that he who sits on the throne lives forever and ever. So those living creatures can't praise and glorify him enough. And verses 9 and 10 again, whenever they give him glory and honour and thanks, the 24 elders, representing all God's people, fall down before him and worship. And they lay their crowns before the throne. You see, even human rule must submit to his supreme and eternal rule. And just look at what they say. It's in verse 11. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Their worship is based on who God is and what God has done. In this chapter, worship is based on God as creator. In chapter 5, we'll see worship based on God as saviour. Apparently, victorious Roman armies returned home to cries of, you are worthy. That's what people chanted as the army marched by. You are worthy, you are worthy of this praise and glory. One particularly arrogant emperor, the emperor, the emperor Domitian, added the words, our Lord and God. That's what he wanted his people to chant as he went by. But no, Jesus shows us who is really God and who is really worthy of such a claim and glory. God created all things, all things, even the coronavirus. It is only by his will that anything and anyone was created and has their being. That's what verse 11 says. We are creatures. He is the creator. And here's the thing. As creator, he has legitimate rights over us and indeed over all creation. We are not the centre of the world. We are not most important in the world. He is. This is God's world, not ours. And everything and everyone exists for his glory. It may be that, he, that that is why he created the coronavirus, to help us to stop worshipping created things instead of him, the creator. Maybe he is prizing our foolish idols out of our hands. You see, he has created plenty of wonderful things to help us know and worship him, but humanity just ignores them and refuses to glorify and worship God. Just think of an artist's exhibition in a gallery, an exhibition that displays his or her work. Wall after wall shows their creativity and skill. It glorifies them, and people rightly praise the artist for what they have done. Well, the universe is a gallery of God's glory. Creation is his handiwork. It is all for his glory, and we should worship him. One Christian man wrote, Evolution is one of the devil's most successful con tricks. I'm inclined to agree. Evolution dispenses with God and makes us foolishly think that millions of very complex things are just random occurrences and that we are the most important beings in the universe. And so we glorify ourselves instead of the one who is worthy of all glory and all worship. God is worthy of all glory and worship because he made everything. If I worship something or someone other than him, I am giving glory to a created thing instead of the creator. You know, all human beings are worshippers. If you're not a Christian or not a religious type of person, you might not consider yourself as a worshipper. But let me tell you that you are a worshipper. However irreligious a person is, they still worship every day. We all do. It's part of who we are. Truth is, we just can't help it. We can't help worshipping any more than we can help breathing. We were made to worship God, who, as creator, 
is worthy of all worship. But if we don't worship him, it doesn't mean that we don't worship. It just means that we worship something or someone else. The word worship stems from the word worth. We worship the person or thing that we give most worth or value to. It might be our family or our home or our team or our garden or our work. It may be the thing we daydream about or the thing we organise our life around. Often we just worship ourselves, our own personal comfort, happiness, fulfilment and satisfaction. Many of the things we worship are good things, but we let them overreach themselves and they become God things. And so they take the place in our hearts that really belongs to God. He is worthy of all worship. But when something else has first place in our hearts, we are effectively worshipping that thing. It has become a substitute God. The thing we look to for happiness or hope or significance or purpose. You know, misplaced worship is a terrible thing and it ends in judgment and condemnation. May I encourage us all today to reevaluate who or what is first in our heart? Who or what do we love most? Perhaps it's our health, or our family, or our team, or our personal comfort and pleasure, or our wealth, or our work, or our hobby. If God is not the answer to those questions, who or what is first in our heart, who or what do we love most, then we need to rethink something. See, that something, whatever is first in our heart, is going to have to move. We may not have to get rid of it, we just need to put it in its right place. You see, Revelation 4 shows us that God is on the throne. He rules over all. He is our creator. He is worthy of all worship. And if we will not give him the worship that is due to him, well then we have set ourselves on a foolish collision course with the God of the universe. And it will not end well. For no kingdom or power or authority can stand against him. Not the Romans, not the Nazis, not the Americans, not the Europeans, not the British, not the Chinese or the Arabs, not coronavirus, not you or me. But that's a great thing for Christians to see, because when we see God's rule and the heavenly worship that is being given to him, we'll be encouraged to stick with Jesus and persevere in our faith and in seeking to live lives of daily worship. See and know that God is on the throne. See and know that God is worthy of all worship. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. We praise you that you did not only create all things, but that you are seated on the throne, still ruling over all things. We thank you that you rule over coronavirus. We worship you, for you are worthy of all worship. Forgive us for when we have not submitted to your rule, and for when we have not given you the worship and glory that you deserve, or for when we have stolen your glory for ourselves. Help us to repent of that and to be encouraged by your rule and then to look forward to the day when, with all your people, we will perfectly worship you as you deserve. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there is only one song that we can sing after hearing about the throne in heaven. Let's stand to sing, There is a Higher Throne.